Chapter 22, July 1914, leading Europe towards the brink. St. Petersburg became the focal point of meaningful decision-making in Europe from mid-July of 1914. That is not to infer that the Tsar or Sazanov suddenly asserted themselves and stood determined to see this through. Far from it. At each stage, the secret elite placemen were physically present to continually and positively reassure the Tsar and Sazanov that they were making the right decisions, reinforcing them in the certainty that their actions were being forced on them by Austria and behind Austria, mendacious Germany. Gray knew that Sazanov would make the de- would make the defense of Serbia an issue of national pride and that the aggressive Russian response would draw Germany into a trap of a European war. Paleolog and Buchanan, the French and British ambassadors in St. Petersburg, were there to constantly embolden him and keep him from wavering from his course as the pressures of such an onerous, onerous task increased. Onerous task increased. Poincaré's presidential visit had been scheduled to renew promises of a joint attack on Germany that would destroy their common enemy and open the straits to Russia's shipping and commerce. The golden carrot of Constantinople and the straits was almost within the Russians' reach. Every player was aware that Austria had constructed a list of stern demands to punish Serbia. It was an open secret. Gray, of course, knew that Sazanov would make an issue of defending Serbia, and Buchanan's task was to keep the Russian foreign minister sufficiently confident to attack Austria if and when she took retaliatory actions against Serbia. Buchanan telegraphed that Sazanov had warned that anything in the shape of Austrian ultimatum could not leave Russia indifferent. Little wonder Serbia felt secure. The Serbian Prime Minister, Pasik, in the midst of an election campaign that would define his political future, had time on 19th of July to forward a telegraph to all Serbian legations instructing them to impress impress on foreign governments Serbia's desire to maintain friendly relations with Austria-Hungary. It is surely a matter of regret regret that he had not sent such messages such instructions earlier to the Serbian press. He further warned that his government could never comply with demands that might be directed against the dignity of Serbia and would be unacceptable to any country which respects and maintains its independence. The dignity of Serbia? An oxymoron, surely. Pasic's message was clear. The Austrian note, as the demands were termed, had to be depicted as the act of a bully against a small, independent country. This approach was far more astute than any Pasik had previously taken. It had all the hallmarks of a professional diplomatist. Others had surely conspired to guide him through the diplomatic minefield. By the 19th of July, the Entente governments knew the basis of the Austrian note and had their response in place. They were prepared to react in unison the moment it was delivered. Birch Toll's delay had given them time to work out their retaliation in advance. This Machiavellian duplicity required careful planning. First-rate diplomatic cunning and the speedy preparation and distribution of a hymn sheet from which Gray, Izvolsky, Poincare, Sazanov, and Pasik could sing in unison the moment the Austrian demands were delivered. They all objected loudly to any implied threat to Serbia's sovereignty. Historians have have described the visit of President Poincare and Prime Minister Vivani to St. Petersburg from 20th to the 23rd July of 1914 as a ceremonial state occasion of no particular consequence. If that was so... Why did they not wait until after the international crisis had settled before embarking for Russia? The entire French diplomatic service was aware of the implications that a war between Austria and Serbia would have for France. 
They knew that an Austrian declaration against Serbia would draw an equal response from Russia, that if Russia took arms against Austria, Germany would be obliged by her alliance to become involved. More pertinently for the French, if Russia went to war, they were bound to treaty to they were bound by treaty to join her. They knew that a crisis of unprecedented severity was at hand. Yet we are asked to believe that this goodwill exchange had no particular purpose. Poincaré and Vivani could have easily delayed in Paris until the crisis had passed. They did not. They chose to go to St. Petersburg and boarded the warship, La France, to Dunkirk. La France at Dunkirk on the 15th of July. After five days at sea, Sazonov, Izvolsky, and Paleolog, the French ambassador at St. Petersburg, warmly welcomed them to Russia. This was no innocent state visit, nor was its timing a matter of chance. Poincaré's very presence in St. Petersburg was ominous. If he had sought a, if he had sought a peaceful resolution to the Austro-Serbian crisis, a letter to the Tsar would have been sufficient. Had Poincaré warned the Russians in, that France would not go to war over Serbia, that would have been the end of the matter. Nicholas II would would never have the would never have had the confidence to act alone. Poincaré stiffened his resolve. Every action taken by Poincaré resonated with the secret elite agenda. On his arrival, he boarded the Tsar's yacht, Alexandria, and immediately went into a deep and private conversation with him. There was an air of pronounced irony in Poincaré's toast to the Tsar at the state dinner, in which he suggested that France would pursue, in, in intimate and daily collaboration, the work for peace and civilization for which both governments stood strove daily. He was unaware of the Cossacks in the streets, the assaults on women and children, trams overturned and wrecks and wrecked in the riots that went on overnight. Civilization had rarely been worse served. The Times corresponded in the St. Petersburg wrote, thanks to the admirable arrangements, the unruly elements were successfully kept off the main thoroughfares. During President Poincaré's visit, which passed off without a hitch. The unruly elements were removed from view, cruelly beaten and even killed, but to the privileged times readership, these victims of poverty and oppression were mere flot sams and jet sams, the incidentals of history. Point Care held court in St. Petersburg. Reports of his private conversation with the Tsar were carried in the press, but no word was written about the substance of their discussions. Indeed, French diplomatic telegrams were altered and suppressed after the war. To conceal the true nature of Poincaré's visit, he met in the Winter Palace with many of the foreign ambassadors to Russia. His discussions with the Japanese ambassadors prepared the way for Japan's intervention later on the side of the Entente. He assured Sir George Buchanan that the Tsar was very conciliatory about Persia. Doubtless the oil purchase had rattled a few Russian samovars. When it came to his formal introduction to the Austrian ambassador, Poincaré talked about his French ancestors, who, but spoke not a word about the tension over Serbia. The president of France was on a mission, as he had been in 1912. How strange that in both years that a European war was seriously possible, between 1912 and 1914, Poincaré made a state visit to Russia. This was no coincidence. The purpose of Poincaré's visit was to reassure the Tsar and Sazonov that France would stand beside them and to encourage them to begin military preparations immediately for war with Germany. Every Russian at court Every Russian at court in St. Petersburg knew that the enemy was Germany and that war would be the outcome. Paleolog wrote in his account of Austinatius banquets how the Grand Duchess Anastasia and Melit Melitza, the respective wives of Grand Duke Nicholas and Grand Duke Peter, were ecstatic at the prospect that war is going to break out. Nothing will be left of Austria. 
you will get Alsace-Lorraine back. Our armies will meet in Berlin. Germany will be annihilated. Clearly, it consumed their thoughts with joyous anticipation. In fact, as elsewhere in Europe, the ruling classes saw war as a solution to civil unrest, unemployment, and loose talk of revolution. They, too, were convinced that war was inevitable. Boincare's endorsement was precisely what they wanted to hear. Buchanan sent a telegram to the Foreign Office in London of the 24th of July, summarizing Poincaré's visit. The French ambassador gave me to understand that France would not only give Russia strong diplomatic support, but would, if necessary, fulfill all the obligations imposed on her by the, elite, by the alliance. Poincaré and Sazanov had agreed the deal. When Russia went to war against Germany and Austria, France would fulfill her commitment to Russia. This telegram explicit, explicitly proved that by the 24th of July, Sir, De, Sir Edward Grey knew that his world war was ordained. The document was concealed from the world for 10 years, as his Volsky's biographer, Staiv, concluded. The blank check for world war signed first by Point Care in 1912 was now signed again. It was no more and no less than Austria given at Potsdam the real check for war, which would be endorsed by Britain, was that which Poincare signed in St. Petersburg. In the Foreign Office, Buchanan's telegram was subjected to min minute scrutiny, and the private notes attached to it demonstrated the inner convolutions of the secret elite thinking. Sir Erie Crow's surgical analysis cut to the heart of the matter. Whatever the merits of the Austrian case against Serbia, he believed it would be impolitic to interfere in St. Petersburg or Paris. Dangerous even. Dangerous? As in any intervention from Britain might stop them starting a war? Put all of this into perspective. Austria had suffered Austria had suffered assassination, humiliation, and taunts from Serbia, but that didn't count. Russia and France had agreed that they would stand together and go to war, which seemed perfectly reasonable to Sir Erie Crow, so Britain should simply let that happen. He phrased his diplomatic comments in the following way. The point that matters is whether Germany is or is not absolutely determined to have this war now. This twisted logic flew in the face of what he already knew. It was not Germany that was determined to have this war now. It was the secret elite. Years of careful and intricate planning would come to naught if, once again, Germany refused to be drawn in, just as she had done in 1912 and 1913. Crow's reasoning contained an awesome revelation. Our interests are tied up with those of France and Russia in this struggle which is not for the possession of Serbia, but one between Germany aiming at a political dictatorship in Europe and the powers who desire to retain individual freedom. Ask yourself this question. What were the coinc coincident interests between Britain and Russia? Shared ambition that could only come to blows in Persia? No, it was war with Germany. Would Britain ever have seriously contemplated giving Russia possession of the Straits? No. Was Russia a land of individual individual freedoms? No. The very notion of the Tsarist Empire being associated with freedoms was ludicrous. Not one single Jewish member of the British Parliament was free to travel into Russia. This twisted illogical bias was nothing more than the bile of secret elite philosophy. Crow ended his minute with a recommendation that the fleet was mobilized as soon as any of the great powers made their step toward, first step to war. But Edward Grey had previously checked that point with Winston Churchill. The fleet was ready and waiting for the coming storm. Feelings in Britain were running high about Ireland, not about Russia, Austria, or Serbia. Nor was there any sense of concern about Germany. Lloyd George had, during a finance bill debate on the 23rd of July,
praised the improving relations between Germany and Britain. He looked forward with confidence to a time when the lunacy of international arms spending might reduce the ridiculous tax burden on the British nation. Take a neighbor of ours, he meant Germany. Our relations are very much better than they were a few years ago. There is none, there is none of that snarling which we used to see, more especially in the press, of those two greats. I will not say rival nations, but two great empires. On the very day that Austria's note was presented to the Serbian government, the British Chancellor of the S. Chekir publicly praised Germany with a speech that hinted at better times ahead. Little wonder the Germans were confused. Little wonder Sazanov immediately required reassurance of Britain's real intentions. In contrast to the deceptions and secret memorandums that hid the real aims of Lloyd George and his trusted accomplices, German politicians had been trying to keep the Austrian response in context. Secretary of State Gottlieb von Jagau, Jagau suggested in the North German Gazette on the 19th of July that a localized war was sufficient and appropriate. It was straightforward. Leave Austria and Serbia to fight it out between them. There were historical precedents that justified such thinking, including Britain's own war with the Transvaal and the United States in her fight against Spain in 1898. Russia and France, however, had no intention of holding the proverbial jackets while Austria sorted poor Serbia. A localized Austro-Serbian affair was never an option for the secret elite. The whole point was to draw Germany into war. Bethmann, the German chancellor, remained quietly assured that all proper protocols were being followed, though he was concerned at the slow pace of Austrian decision-making. He sent instructions to the German ambassadors in St. Petersburg, London, and Paris to stress that Austria had every just cause to punish Serbia. He stated that unless Austria was willing to dispense for forever its standing as a great power, it had to enforce its demands. Bethmann was confident that in the aftermath of Archduke Ferdinand's assassination, the Tsar would understand the need for the monarchs of Europe to stand together against a political radicalism that sought to put an end to emperors and Tsars, kings and queens, and all the trappings of monarchy. Austria presented the note to Serbia once Poincare and the French delegation had departed St. Petersburg on the 23rd of July. The delay was futile. The French and Russians had already made their faithful but still secret tryst, and Sazanov's commitment to protect Serbia was absolute. All had been determined long before the Austrian demands became public. Berchtold insisted that the note was non-negotiable. He cannot enter the ne into negotiations with Serbia with regard to our demands and cannot be satisfied with anything less than their unconditional acceptance within the stated terms. Otherwise, we should be obliged to draw further consequences. Baron von Gieslingen, the Austro-Hungarian minister at Belgrade, handed the note to the Serbian government at 6 p.m. Thursday, 23rd of July. It comprised ten demands that had been leaked over the preceding weeks, and as far as Birchtoll was aware, he caused little obvious anxiety. Basically, the Serbs were instructed to stop anti-Austrian publications, dissolve the secret society Nor Noradna Abrana, put an end to the teaching of anti-Austrian propaganda in schools, and sack all civil servants and military personnel who were openly anti-Austrian. The note insisted that Austro-Hungarian police be permitted to cooperate with the Serbs and take part in a judicial inquiry into the conspiracy that had led to the assassination in Sarajevo. Known conspirators, and here the note correctly named, Tansunik and Siganovic, had to be placed under arrest as had those who fragrantly assisted the assassins by smuggling arms and explosives over the border into Bosnia. They wanted to know why high-ranking high -ranking Serbian officials 
had continually had continued to verbally assault Austro-Hungarian even after the outrage. Finally, a 48-hour deadline was set for an unequivocal acceptance of each of every point. Virtually every demand was already known to the secret elite agents, including the time scale for a reply. Burstoll and his advisors were totally unprepared for what happened next, despite all of the international support and encouragement that they had been given over the preceding weeks. What followed was an orchestrated overreaction from Russia, France, and Britain, whose well-coordinated pretense at outrage was completely at odds with previous sentiments. Those who had encouraged strong Austrian action now declared, rather than aiming the justice from Serbia, Austria was abusing the situation as a pretext to provoke a war. The argument turned in the most bizarre way. Austria was accused of having presented no evidence of the Serbian complicity, and they insisted that more time ought to be given for the Serbian reply. It was a sham, a blatant attempt to gain additional time for the Russian and French military preparations. Austria remained unmoved and insisted on a reply within 48 hours. On the 24th of July, Austro-Hungarian ambassadors were subject to verbal abuse when they presented their demands of Serbia to the Entente governments. In St. Petersburg, Sazanov exploded at the Austrian ambassador, constantly interrupting his attempt to explain the note. I know what you want. You want to go with war. You want to go to war with Serbia. You are setting fire to Europe. Point by point, Sazanov challenged the rejected every. Point by point, Sazanov challenged and rejected every part of the Austrian note. How dare the Austrian government demand the dissolution of Navarna or Brana? Why were they insisting that Austrian police officers be involved in the investigations? His lack of perspective made nonsense of this unprofessional tantrum. But since he already had detailed knowledge of the demands, it was a sham. Sir Edward Grey met with Count Mensdorf, the Austrian ambassador to Britain, at Downing Street on the morning of the 24th of July. Given that he was not known to rush to judgment, Grey's immediate pronouncement that the note was the most formidable document that has ever been addressed from one state to another was ridiculous. When Mensdorf tried to explain the merits of the case, Gray rejected the argument as not our concern. He could hardly have been more dismissive. This too was a sham. It was a different it was different in Paris. With all the senior ministers who might have dealt with the Austrian explanation literally at sea, the note was handed to the Minister of Justice, whose moderate and unemotional reaction was in complete contrast to the paroxysms paroxysms elsewhere, paroxysms elsewhere. No one had thought to give him, no one had thought to give him the Entente's official script. With near incident haste, with near indecent haste, Paul Cambon, the French ambassador at London, was ordered back to France to hold the fort at Quai d'Orsay. While the Entente foreign ministers orchestrated as close to a perfect storm of indignation as they could muster, several British newspapers considered the Austrian demands to be perfectly justified. The Manchester Guardian, the Daily News, and the Daily Chronicle all voiced a reasoned understanding of the Austrian police, of the Austrian position. Of the conservative newspapers, the Daily Telegraph was the most impartial. It supported the Austrians in demanding full and prompt repudiation of all those nefarious schemes which have politics as their excuse and murder as their handmaid. The Manchester Guardian deeply regretted that Russia was prepared to threaten extreme measures if strong Austrian action was forced upon Serbia. As its editorial explained, Austria had a good reason to be overbearing towards Serbia but Russia's threat of war is a piece of sheer brutality, not disguised by her sudden discovery of the sacredness of the balance of power in Europe. 
It was a sarcastic but justified rebuff to the Russian presumption of interest in Serbian affairs. Predictably, the Times was batting for the other side. An editorial published two days before the note was handed over under the heading A Danger to Europe supported the Russians and cast doubt on Austrian intentions to localize the war. As ever, the voice of the secret elite was a step ahead. Asquith decried the Austrian note as bullying and humiliating, but in private he confided to his secret love, Venetia Stanley, that the curious thing is that on many, if not most of the points, Austria has a good and Serbia has a very bad case. But the Austrians are quite the stupidest people in Europe. He knew that Gray had greatly exaggerated his reaction to the Austrian demands, but could never say so in public. Indeed not. Their public stance, their pre pretense of outrage, represented a, a prepared position that aligned the foreign office with the outburst from Sazonov in Russia and Poincare's once back on French soil. By undermining Austria-Hungary, they were simultaneously undermining the one nation that would stand with her, Germany. Members of Asquith's cabinet knew only what they read in the newspapers. With the singular exception of the notorious five, they were, igno they were ignorant of the Entente's connivance in the Austria-Serbia dispute. Cabinet met on the afternoon of the 24th of July and discussed shootings in doublings and the shipping of German guns to the Irish volunteers at great length, and then almost as an aside, the rapidly deteriorating Serbian crisis was raised. According to Winston Churchill, the discussion on Ireland had reached its inconclusive end and the cabinet was about to separate when Sir Edward Grey produced the Austrian note, which he claimed had just been brought to him from the Foreign Office. The message they wanted cabinet members to believe was that this was an ultimatum such as had never been penned in modern times. Charles Hobhouse, the Postmaster General in Athquist's 1914 cabinet, wrote in his diary, Gray broke in to say that the ultimatum by Austria to Serbia had brought us nearer to a European Armageddon than we had been through all the Balkan troubles. He had suggested that Germany, France, Italy, and the UK should jointly press Austria, jointly press Austria and Russia to abstain from action but he was certain that if Russia attacked Austria, Germany was bound to come to the latter's help. If Churchill's recall was correct, Gray must have staged the delivery for dramatic effect. We know that the note had not just been brought to Gray that afternoon, but was handed to him in Downing Street that morning when he had ranted at Count Mensdorf. That apart, Look how the Foreign Office had twisted the note into an ultimatum. Hobhouse even gave the word a capital letter. Notice, how, notice too how in Hobhouse version, it was not Germany at, that was at fault. The key to war or peace was Russia. If Russia attacked Austria, Germany was bound to come in. That would be the same Russia just given a blank check by Poincare. The same Russia with which Sir Erie Crow had advised it would be impolitic and dangerous to interfere. In all of the bluster, the claims and counterclaims that were lodged once war began, focus was placed on Austrian note as if it were the cause of war itself. Austria, however, had been on the receiving end of Serbia's troublemaking and, promise, and broken promises for years. The Serbian government had participated in the criminal activities of various societies in Serbia and their, and their outrageous anti-Austrian invective. In the days and weeks before the note was delivered in Belgrade, Austria had amassed considerable evidence on the assassins and their controllers. What they were demanding was the minimum required for the normalization of relationships. No vague promises, no procrastination. The basis for a positive resolution to what had proved an intractable problem was laid on the table 
It was non-negotiable but fair. How else could they have begun to build a lasting, constructive, and meaningful future? The note comprised the minimum conditions that would guarantee Austrian safety from the Serbian menace. At 3 p.m. July 25th, that is three hours before the end of Austria's 48-hour deadline, Serbia formally mobilized its armed forces. Frantic military preparations got underway. State archives, the treasury, and the civil service decamped from Belgrade to, to the interior city of Nish before they handed over their reply, and in the knowledge that it failed to meet the Austrian demands, the Serbians declared their intent. Serbia was getting ready for war. Not that they were the only ones in a hurry. Pasik personally delivered its form, the formal reply a few minutes before 6 p.m. on the 25th of July, and the Austrian ambassador and his entire legation were on their way home on the 6th on the 6.30 p.m. express from Belgrade. The Serbian reply was carefully crafted and moderate in character. It not only won the approval and sympathy of the Entente's powers, but also the neutrals everywhere. It even commanded the admiration of Birchtoll, who described the reply as the most brilliant example of diplomatic skill which I've ever known. But he added that, though it appeared to be reasonable, it was wholly worthless in content. The diplomatic language certainly had all the hallmarks of a professional tactician. Pasik had pre previously replied on Hartwig, the Russian ambassador, whose ultimately death ought to have left him bereft of ideas. Yet out of nowhere, this comparative non-entity apparently produced a master stroke of international diplomacy. Pasik was reputedly a lost, floundering soul without his Russian mentor. So who was behind the Serbian reply? Belgrade had immediately appealed to Sazanov, Paleolog, and the Tsars for help. Behind the scenes, the telegraph lines were between London, Belgrade, St. Petersburg, and Paris nearly went into meltdown. Sir Edward Grey telegraphed Belgrade on the e Friday evening, the 24th of July, at 9.30 p.m. to advise the Serbs on how they should respond. He specifically suggested that they give a favorable reply on as many points as possible within the limit of time and not to meet Austria with a blank negative. He wanted them to apologize, express regret for the conduct of their officials, and reply in a manner that represented the best interests of Serbia. Gray refused to give any further advice without liaising, direct, liaising directly with Russia and France. His time-serving words sufficed to cover the fact that Britain, France, and Russia had already agreed their joint position. The greatest input to the Serbian reply came from Paris in the person of Philippe Berthelot, Assistant Director for Political Affairs at the French Foreign Office. He was one of the most senior diplomats in Europe and highly regarded by Poincaré and the secret elite. Berthelot first admitted that he had outlined the extremely astute reply for Serbia and later boasted that he actually drafted its very wording. He reaffirmed Gray's advice that Serbia should offer immediate satisfaction on all points except the one that affected her sovereignty. In St. Petersburg, Sazanov had likewise counseled the Serbs on extreme moder moderation. The secret elite primed the Serbians with a staged strategy. Step one had been Pasik's telegram on the 19th, a honey-dripped appeal for support based on a plea for dignity, respect, and independence. Step two was to get Pasik out of Belgrade. They knew that the Austrians intended to present their demands on the 23rd of July, so ensured that Pasik was out of the Serbian capital on, the, on an election campaign, an arrangement that was released in advance to the press in, of Europe. This was a ploy to force the Austrians to extend the time permitted for an official response. It didn't work. Finally, they had ensured that there were no significant charges, the affairs, or ambassadorial representatives 
from any of the Entente powers in Belgrade that weekend so that whatever transpired, no one from France, Russia, or Britain could be associated with the official response. The input from London, Paris, and St. Petersburg represented a massive public relations offensive on behalf of Serbia. The reply was couched in very conciliatory language with feigned humility and apparent openness and sincerity. European opinion still sided with Austria rather than Serbia, and that would have been re reinforced had the Serbs presented an arrogant or insulting reply. Serbia had to be reinvented as a brave and helpless little nation that had gone beyond the boundaries of national dignity in surrendering to Austria's harsh demands. Of all the diplomatic ruses before the war began, there was no cleverer subterfuge than the planning of the Serbian response to Austria. To the unwitting, it appeared as though all points bar two had been accepted and that poor little Serbia had yielded to the immense and unfair pressure from her neighbor. Kaiser Wilhelm, for example, returned from his three-week cruise and hailed the Serbian reply as a triumph of diplomacy, of diplomacy when he first read it. Wilhelm jotted, Wilhelm jotted on it, a brilliant performance for a time limit of only 48 hours. This is more than one could have expected. He was convinced that the Austrians would be satisfied and that the few reservations Serbia had on the particular points could be cleared up by negotiation. Kaiser Wilhelm's immediate and spontaneous response clearly indicated his belief, indeed his joy, that all risk of war had been removed. With it, the Serbian response, every reason for war falls to the ground. Wilhelm's analysis was sadly naive. He accepted the Serbians' concessions at face value, but the Austrians did not. The reply included carefully constructed conditions and reservations that were not immediately apparent. First impressions can often be misleading. While the Serbian response appeared to consent to virtually every Austrian demand, it was so hedged with qualifications that the Austrians were bound to take umbrage. Only two of the Austrians' demands, number 8 and 10, were accepted in their entirety, while the answers to the others were evasive. Reservations and lies had been carefully disguised by skillfully dissembling. For example, where the note insisted on the arrest of Tansunik and Siganovic, the reply stated that Siganovic had fled it and it had not been possible to arrest him. The implications that the Serbians were actually trying to arrest him was a lie. Siganovic was a personal friend of Pasik, and the Prime Ministers knew that his friend had been secretly reaccommodated with the full knowledge and assistance of the Serbian Chief of Police. The most important Austrian demand was rejected outright. Berstold insisted that judicial proceedings be taken against everyone associated with the assassination plot and that Austro-Hungarian police officers be directly involved in the investigations. Serbia balked at this, claiming that such an intrusion would be a violation of her constitution. That was not the case. The Austrians had demanded that their police be allowed to assist in the investigation of the crime, not that its officials be allowed to participate in internal Serbian court procedures. There were numerous precedents for such cross-border police involvement, but the Serbs nailed their colors to this spurious assertion and claimed that the Austrian note was an infringement of, of their sovereignty. How strange, the Belgian ambassador had warned three weeks earlier that Serbian sovereignty would become the central issue. The secret elite knew that Austria would not accept the reply. It was specifically designed to be rejected. No amount of cosmetic wordplay could cover the fact that it did not accede to the Austrian stipulations. The lie that Austria-Hungary deliberately made the note so tough that Serbia would have no choice but to refuse it has unfortunately been set in concrete by some historians. The argument put forward generally claims that war was to be provoked and the murder of the Archduke provided a perfect occasion. The Austrians were told that they should use it to attack Serbia, Russia's client, and the means chosen was an ultimatum containing demands that could not be accepted without the loss of Serbian independence. 
This was the myth that the secret elite wanted to promulgate, promulgate, namely that Austria was told by Germany to attack Serbia. The best lie is the big lie. If Austria was hell-bent on war with Serbia, why did she entertain the grueling three-week diplomatic route? Freed from extraneous interference, the Austrian em army was entirely capable of defeating Serbia. Hawks in the Austrian military had demanded an immediate attack, but the diplomats insisted on the long delay note that unwittingly gave Britain, France, and Russia time to lay their trap. The Serbian reply and Austria's consequent reaction sprang the trap. On the 25th of July, Sir George Buchanan in St. Petersburg penned a strictly confidential telegram to Sir Edward Grey. It arrived in the Foreign Office at 10.30 p.m. The message could not have been clearer. Russia cannot allow Austria to crush Serbia and become the predominant power in the Balkans and secure of support of France, she will face all the risks of war. From whose imagination did the notion of Serbia being crushed by Austria spring? No such aim had ever been put forward by Berchtold. The allegation that Austria wanted to crush Serbia was yet another piece of propaganda manufactured to justify the Entente's overreaction. But where still was the French connection, the blank check, secure of the support of France? Russia was prepared to face all the risks of war. Buchanan spelled out the absolute reassurances that Poincaré had given to Sazonov. These were in fact more than reassurances. This was an incitement to war. Poincaré was inviting Sazanov to lead the line, promising that both countries would march behind the same banner. It was precisely what the secret elite had planned. It was not the Austrian note that made war inevitable. It was the Serbian reply designed to provoke the reaction for which Russia, France, and Britain were prepared. Summary Chapter 22, July 14th leading Europe towards the brink. St. Petersburg became the center of critical decision-making. The secret elite agents, Poincaré and Izbalski, aided by Paleolog and Buchanan, were there to ensure that the Tsar and Sazonov took a firm stance against Austria. Poincaré went to St. Petersburg, as he had done in 1912, to promise that France would go to war on the side of Russia if Germany took arms on the part of Austria. This was the real blank check for war. Sir George Buchanan ensured that Gray was fully conversant with the progress towards war and was regularly at Sazonov's side to reassure him. Russia and Russian policy towards her own people was anathema to most cultured and knowledgeable Britons. They would never have accepted a military alliance with Russia. In Parliament and in the Cabinet, details were withheld about the deterioration of international relations until 24th of July. Germany was deceived into thinking that her relations with Britain had substantially improved through parliamentary, press, and diplomatic discussion, while secret elite agents in the Foreign Office were plotting her destruction. Austrian Foreign Minister Birch told was repeatedly reassured, was repeatedly assured that other nations understood the need for a sharp Austrian retaliation. While unknown to him, Britain, France, and Russia prepared a collective entire and entirely negative response to the demands contained in the Austrian note. The demands by Austria, made by Austria were neither unexpected nor unfair. The response from the Entente group were disproportionately overexcited. Berchtold's delay gifted them a three-week window in which to manufacture their considered reaction. The Serbian reply was a diplomatic triumph designed by the secret elite to appear conciliatory but trigger the Austrian military threat and all that would ensue. Germany had become concerned at the slow pace of the Austrian demands on Serbia and the Kaiser, for one, was delighted, was delighted that the Serbian reply seemed to remove any likelihood of war. The Serbian reply sprang the trap that had been laid for Birch told. 
The secret elite's race to war was gathering momentum. Sir Edward Grey knew by the 25th of July that Russia was prepared to face all risks of war.